Hey, welcome to The Quad, the new board game geek show where four infamous characters from around the world of hobby gaming meet to discuss game-related topics. Each one of us will argue, defend, or fight to have their chosen example be shown to be the best example in the given topic for this week's show. I'm Stephen Bonacore, hobby game entrepreneur, game media personality, game industry veteran, you can find me all over the internet, Facebook, Twitter, especially on YouTube as the pod father of gaming. I'm Candace Harris. I am a media creator for Board Game Geek. I host the BGG podcast. I host Cardboard Creations, a show where I interview game designers and I play a ton of board games. <laughs> I am Matthew McCack from Room 51. I'm one half of Room 51. I co-host it. We, you can find us on Twitch and YouTube streaming board games, uh, playing board games, and just talking about all things board gaming. Uh, you could also find me on the Dice Hour for Teach the Teach and Board Game Breakfast. Hi, I'm Benita Kaur. I'm a board game Twitch streamer as well. Um, I stream board games on my channel on Mondays and Wednesdays, and I also run social media for Meister Media and my local game store called Games and Stuff. So I dabble in lots of different things. <laughs> Excellent. Today on this show, we're going to discuss. Okay, Derek, give me another drum roll. <laughs> games based on public domain property. We are each going to tell you why our example is the best of these games or our favorite in the genre or what makes it special in this category. Matthew, why don't you tell us what it means? Games based on public domain properties. Yeah, so Stephen and I have uh, argued for days about what this actually means, <laughs> but I'm going to tell, <laughs> tell you what it really is. So uh, public domain <laughs> games is, uh, it. when I think of public domain games, I'm thinking of IPs or intellectual properties where no one really owns the license to it. So these games tend to have uh, or, or use a theme based on books or maybe folklore, uh, where no one really owns the rights to it. So this is also why you will see a lot of board games just come out with this type of theme. Yeah. So like games based on classic literature, stories and legends, which is what I wanted to call this, but you didn't yeah, want to yeah. call it that. So this is what we're going <laughs> with. Right, yeah. Games right. based on public <laughs> domain properties. So why don't we start with Candace? Sure thing. Yeah, we'll we'll start with the best game on this list here, and that is <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Wonderland's <laughs> War, <laughs> which is a game that came out in 2022 from uh, Druid City Games, designed by Tim Eisner, Ben Eisner, and Ian Moss. And Wonderland's War is an amazing Alice in Wonderland themed bag building, card drafting, push your luck combat game for two to five players. And each player takes on the role of a famous character from Alice in Wonderland. You can play as Alice, you can play as Cheshire Cat, Mad Hatter, Queen of Hearts, etc. Everybody has asymmetric powers. Really, really cool. But uh, the goal of the game is you want to be named the ruler of Wonderland uh, by the end of the game or just have the most victory points. So again, each player has asymmetrical powers, which is awesome. And then each player has their own player board and a bag that you're going to be adding these faction chips to. And the game board is gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. This big game board in the center of it. There's a uh, table for the uh, the tea party table, and then around the board there are different uh, battleground regions where you're going to be trying to win some battles and the each battleground region has a varying number of points you can score each round so it's played over three rounds each round there's a tea party phase and a war phase and in the tea party phase you're going to be moving your character around the table to draft cards so you can prepare for battle and like add different ally chips to your bag uh, place supporters. You have these little meeples that you'll be able to place into these different regions. You can recruit these awesome Wonderlandians. And like the Wonderlandians are so cool because <laughs> they give you other people that you can, you know, add to different battle regions and special powers and special chips you can add to your bag. But then, I mean, this game is all about the war phase. So in the war phase, 
you know, whoever, whichever characters end up with, you know, their forces in a different region, you're going to resolve one region at a time. And the way that works is anybody who's involved in the battle is going to take their bag of all these chips, you know, your faction chips that started in there. If you recruited any allied chips or special Wonderlandia chips, you're going to reach in that bag and you're going to hold your hand out with anybody else who's in the battle simultaneously reveal a chip okay and then you know if if at any point because this is a push your lucky you want to stop you would reveal your hand empty but anyway you're going to be revealing chips and depending on the number on the chips or any special effects with the chip you're going to increase your strength on this combat track and you're going to keep doing this until either everybody's out or people bust because you can draw madness chips and if you get a certain amount of madness chips you'll bust um, but you'll keep doing this until there's one character standing and then they will score points for the region and uh, get to put a castle down it's super cool so you resolve every region and uh yeah this game is just it's it's fantastic you know number one people love alice in wonderland and this game feels very thematic the artwork is incredible and also the bag building that you're doing is very satisfying um if anybody's familiar with quacks of quiddlingburg which is another banger um it yeah. takes that kind of system of your pulling chips out but i feel like it makes it even cooler than quacks of quiddlingburg especially if you can handle a slightly, a slightly more complex game than Quacks of Quillingburg. But the combat yeah. is really exciting because you're simultaneously revealing and you know deciding how much you personally want to push your luck, but you're also, it's competitive. So you, you feel that like competitive energy. Um, there are a ton of awesome, interesting decisions as you're drafting cards and deciding, you know, what how much you want to put different character you know maybe get, do i want to get a wonderlandian um or should i try to get rid of some of these shards which are bad for me you know there are lots of like awesome interesting decisions in the game and then there's a ton of variety i mean i don't even know how many wonderlandians there are but you want you, you'll play several games and not see them all but they add uh so much flair and spice to the game so it's really nice to have that variety to make all of the games feel different. Um, even the basic chips, like the basic chips have an ability that you can, these uh, ally chips you can recruit. They have a, an ability, but each game, there are like three or maybe four different abilities you can have for each type of chip. So it's super cool. It's one of my favorite games of 2022. And I think it was on a lot of people's favorite games of yeah. 2022. So that, I mean, that's why I think Wonderland's War is a banger. It is a great alice in wonderland theme board game what do y'all think well. i haven't played it i haven't played it which is very unfortunate because i really wish i had played it but i feel like as soon as you mentioned the back building and it being similar to quacks and like i am very guilty of pushing my luck to like an nth degree where i lose most push your luck games <laughs> So I'm, I'm a little afraid how I would do in the combat. Like I would just be like, no, no, let's go for it. And just like instantly bust. I feel like that would be my experience. <laughs> there are ways, there are ways to mitigate it. And you, you have to draw a certain amount of madness chips. So, uh, yeah. I think you would enjoy this one quite a bit. Um, Steven, uh, did you have something to say? You know, it's great that you put this on the list and, um, when I recently just did there. A, just stop there. I can just stop there. It's great <laughs> that you put this in list because I can then say that this is like such a it's like a bad version of Quacks of Quellenberg is really what this comes <laughs> oh, down to. Oh, you know, that. it's like, you know, I don't mind I like Quacks quite a bit and I like bag building. And I this game really fell flat for me. Um and I like mm. conf, games of conflict. And it just didn't work. I mean, it, it felt weird that I was going against people with random draws it just didn't work mechanically for me and the the asymmetry was so big in this game it was like asymmetrical on type of asymmetrical it's like there's so many different powers going on that you can't even kind of figure out what to do and when to do it and there's so much luck in the game 
between the bag building, between like when I go last and I'm not going to be able to get the area control. So th this is like, to me, was a mess of mechanics of uh, area control and bag building, the dice. And, uh, is it a bad game? No. But does it show this theme? No, it doesn't. There's even characters that don't belong <laughs> in Alice in Wonderland. It's like, it's like they're just adding characters. Like, okay, let's put in um, uh, Humpty, not Humpty Dumpty, the Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Are they in Alice in Wonderland? There's, there's all kinds of characters that don't make sense for this. Um, I, I, I wasn't a fan. It's not a bad game. It isn't, <laughs> I'm going to be honest. But And I would try it again, but it really didn't work for me. I think you're in the minority here. Um, I probably I think am. anybody who likes quacks and maybe wants a little more from that type of bag building experience, I think it just crushes it. I think you also have a lot of control of placing uh, your, I forget what they're called, your little meeples out. So when you draft cards, a card will let you put a certain amount of meeples out into a region. So that is going to automatically boost your combat. So there's a lot you can do to mitigate the luck, uh, <laughs> but also build a better bag, Steven. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if you're strategic about how you build your bag <laughs> and your allies, it is awesome. Uh, Matthew, what are your Basically, thoughts? <laughs> Candace said, get good, Steven. That's what she yeah, said. Get good. Get, <laughs> kind of. Thank you for translating. Get, get good or go. Yeah. <laughs> get good. Uh, I have to say, I have not played this game. I really wanted to. I was actually supposed to teach it um, at Dice Tower East, but it looks so big. I got scared and just like stayed away from that table um, uh, for the hot games area. And so I have to say, I'm not a huge fan of Alice in Wonderland, or of Wonderland? In Wonderland. Um, I don't know, the whole story kind of just like creeped me out as a child, and so I just like <laughs> stayed away from it. Um, but Fair. it, Fair. The, all the mechanisms you were saying are things that seem so up my alley. Like I love bag building, love push your luck. I think you mentioned like card drafting. I love that, uh, combat and everything. Um, Steven, what you were saying was kind of like, oh, maybe I should try before I buy kind of thing. Like maybe it is a mess of me uh, mechanisms. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know. I know that we're comparing it to like Quacks of Quesenberg. Um, I love Quacks. Um, I think it's a great game. I don't know. I mean, just based off of what you're saying is, uh, I don't know if I'd actually like compare the two to be like, oh, if you like this and you're wanting something more, I'd go to Wonderland. Like it kind of seems like we're comparing apples to oranges. I'm not sure. Um, because I haven't actually played the game, but <laughs> I would like to try the game and then I'll see uh, who I actually agree with. Yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah. People, I mean, I'm not the only one who says when you describe Wonderland's War, if you just have a couple words, quacks with combat, you know, with, with area yeah. majority scoring combat. And frankly, it crushes it. I mean, at BGG Con, I was on a panel with about 10 other people and I'm pretty sure eight out of 10 of us had it in our top 10 of 2022. Wow. So again, I think okay. Steven's in the minority here. I definitely encourage mm -hmm. both of you to try it and see I it for yourself. It. The only the to. only negative, and I'll put a little negative on my choice here, is that it can run long. And oh, that is, long. you know, it, it can run a little bit long, but it's still very engaging and entertaining. So that doesn't bother me. Um, but I'm maybe- assuming I'm assuming because it's an area control game, it's better at like three to four to five. Like, do, is there like a sweet like player count for you? It's, it's great at all player counts, but okay. I would say if you are trying to keep the play time down, uh, lower. Like I learned it at three, Steph Hodge taught me and yeah. she was like in love with it. I was like, I have to show you this game. And after she showed me this game, I was like, oh dang, I have to get this game. So anyway, that's Wonderland's War. It is fantastic. Benita, what, what game did you pick? So I so when I was told the theme of the, the episode today, I was like, okay, one of the first games that came to mind was Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective because this is one of the games that I played like 
within my first few years of gaming because Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective has been around since 1982. It has been published by so many different publishers. Currently, I believe it is Space Cowboy under the Asmodee banner. So the um, designers that I have it pulled up on BGD right now <laughs> is Raymond <laughs> Edwards, Suzanne Goldberg, and Gary Grady. Um, so this game has been around forever. So in Sherlock Holmes, Consulting Detective, you are Victorian era detectives solving murder mysteries in London. The um, box comes with 10 cases um, and you play each case separately. Um, and roughly each case, depending on like how well you do is like an hour to two hours. You're just like gathering clues, you're interviewing suspects, you're searching for evidence. Um, in a race against, not time, but in a race against Sherlock Holmes, because at the end, when you enter in your answers, and then you compare your answers to Sherlock Holmes, and you see how well you did compared to him. I haven't heard a story of where anyone has actually beat Sherlock Holmes. And this variation of Sherlock Holmes in the game is very snooty, very arrogant, which I think emulates the best Sherlock Holmes. So, like, I've heard people <laughs> complain about that, but I love it. I don't play the game because I want to be Sherlock Holmes. I just want to, like, not, like, have my score in the negatives. Because, like, the first time I played, <laughs> my score was in the negatives. So, like, what you're doing is that like, you have a case and then everything else is just, like, you know, you... Like, it's just codes in the sense of, like, you know what, let's go to the crime scene. So I flip to, like, D52, and I, I flip to it. And then, like, you just kind of, like, solve things that way. Um, every place that you go to is, like, minus five points. So, you know, if you go to 100 spots, you're going to have a stupidly high negative number. But then, obviously, you get points depending on if your answers are correct. Um, you know, you're definitely putting your deduction skills um up to the test, <laughs> to like the Sherlock Holmes test. This game, I believe, plays up to one to four players. My sweet spot is playing it at two because there's there's um only one map, there's only one case. So, and every case comes with its own newspaper, which I think is really cool. Some, a lot of the articles have nothing to do with the case. I just love that they made a newspaper. Um, and... I like one of my fondest memories of playing this game is that a friend came over. It was raining. I was drinking like a whiskey and Coke, which is like so cliche, <laughs> but I was. <laughs> um, and we just like, we just like spent like, you know, almost two hours just kind of like going through everything. And at a certain point, we're just like, I kind of want to see like, just like kind of like see the story in every location. Like, I don't really care about like, getting a good score i just i'm so into this mystery that i want to like go to locations i want to like question witnesses i want to interrogate people and it was just it was such a good time it's not a party game it's not a game i recommend with a lot of people i i mean and it's if you i'm not a solo gamer but i can see uh solo people in like gamers enjoying it because you're just reading you know so like it's like reading a book but like also playing a game yeah, so that's Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. I am a big fan of this one. So since I was so negative before, let me go first. And uh, I'm going to I'm going to say that this is a game that is really hard for me to criticize at all. Um it 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 is solid. It is it really taxes your brain um yeah. uh to to come up with the right answers the way Sherlock Holmes would or period just just try to solve these cases. Um the, uh, so yes, it's it's solid. It's a great game in this genre. It absolutely would have made my top ten list. Um, the the only issues are you kind of feel dumb when you play this game because you're just gonna do badly versus Sherlock Holmes, of course. Yes, um, I felt dumb but, the first time. But I the it. storytelling <laughs> aspects of the game that you're actually going through this and you're visiting places in London and you're and you're going and talking to people all in a book form. And I love those kind of games. They're in book yeah. forms. It's just great great games that use like a book to tell the story as part of them um really solid so uh, this is a great choice thank you <laughs> what For do you me, think I, uh, yeah i actually um i have beaten sherlock multiple times so i think Whoa. the game was actually too easy um, you smart ass totally <laughs> okay. i've never played this game <laughs> i've never played this game <laughs> I was going to be like, damn, oh, where do you go? Yeah. <laughs> that is great. No, no. Yeah, no, I, I'd probably, uh, uh, I wouldn't feel dumb. I would just already know 
that I'm dumb and like we got beat <laughs> a lot. So um, I, it's like, it, it is what it is. But um, for me, I, it's weird because for a long time, I wanted to play these games. Um, and then I heard about the snootiness and I was like, well, that's Sherlock, you know, like he's, he's a yeah. snobbish guy, you know. Um, but then like, as I, 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 I think I, I like I was about to start to purchase maybe like one of the Sherlock games and then mm -hmm. Chronicles of Crime came out and I was just like, ooh, uh, well, that seems cool. Um, and so then mm -hmm. I went the Chronicles of Crime route and then I just never played any of the Sherlock yeah. stuff just because I was like, oh, yeah, app and everything. And it's like telling me the story and I'm figuring things out and I still feel yeah. dumb, but it's OK. Um, and yeah, they, so I don't know. I, I like the Sherlock theme. Um, I don't know how much the theme comes out, I guess, in, in this other than like, you're, you're solving the case and, and then Sherlock's yelling at you for doing a bad job. Um, but... <laughs> That's mostly where the theme comes out. <laughs> okay. And like, I get the whole Chronicles of Crime comparison. I just think that they feel like they're same. They're working in the same sphere. They're both like solving crime, solving mysteries. Um, and especially Chronicles of Crime, you can have an old timey, they have an old timey like one. Yeah. But it's a very different experience because you put your phone away, you know, like there is no <laughs> phone element in this game. So like, like, you know, Chronicles of Crime or even Detective from Portal, like you need your computer, you need your phone to play. This is like put your phones away and kind of just like immerse yourself in it. You're doing a lot of reading. Also, I really enjoy the reading out loud. I think because I'm a Twitch streamer, I like reading out loud. It's kind of performative. So like mm -hmm. when my friends and I play, like I'll like, you know, read out the passages in kind of like my horrible London accent <laughs> and like nice. things like that. So it does feel different. Like I think it's a good comparison, but I will say as someone who's played both and enjoys both, they feel different to me. That's a good point about the phones and, you know, these weren't even invented or even close to being invented when this game came out in 1982. So it is, it is old school in every way, but, yeah. uh, but really good in, in all of the things that are old school about gaming. Yeah, I haven't played it and I'd be willing to give it a try, but I think for me, the reading is maybe going to be a turn off. Like, I mm. I find that, you know, I love Arkham Horror, the card game, and read having some of that, like, narrative in games, but even some, some scenario or some campaigns of that, I feel like sometimes it's a little too much. So I don't know yeah. if everybody would love that aspect when you're kind of sure. trying to get more yeah. of a game. Um, but that being said, yes, it has been around for a while. And I feel like people always say good things about it, like you. And uh, yeah. I, I'd be willing to give it a try. Yeah, I mean, it's been published by like so many different publishers. So like, you know, I feel like the fact that it's con like you can go get it right now from your local game store. Right. So I feel like that it's constantly in print. People are constantly still talking about it, even though it's been like what it was like in 1982 is a very long time ago. <laughs> so like, mm -hmm. I think that's pretty impressive. I do agree with the whole reading thing. I, if you don't like to read or you, it's, you don't want too much reading in games, this might not be the right game for you. Um, definitely. I happen to love reading. I also grew up reading like historical romance novels. So like this nice. is a romance in Sherlock Holmes. Let me just make that clear. But like it gives <laughs> me that like vibe of like, you know, my like teenage years <laughs> when I read a lot of historical novels. And I think that also is another reason why I like it so much. I just realized that none of you were born then. Were you? I was not. 82? No. I was no. not. No. No. So I, I can't connect to the game. That's why. I was in 1982. So we're not even going to go there. So. <laughs> <laughs> so how old are you in 1982? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. Don't, 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 such a rude question to ask me. <laughs> am, I, next? am I next? Is that, it's me, I think. Yeah. Uh, well, my, my pick um, is... Clearly the best one. So uh, it's Robinson Crusoe, Adventures on the Cursed Island. Um, and this one, so this was published in, when was this published? 2012. Um, and it, it it's also designed by uh, Ignacy Trevichek and published by Portal Games. 
Uh, this is a cooperative style game where uh, it goes up to four players. So one to four players could play this game. And you are trying to survive on this cursed island. And oh my gosh, this game is hard. It, I, I love <laughs> really difficult cooperative games. I know, Stephen, you can't handle it. But me, I'm all about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, this one... Uh, so it, there's about like 12, I think, different scenarios that come in the box. They actually are coming out with like a definitive edition now where, you know, storybook and all that. I actually back that. I'm excited for that. Um, but this <laughs> one, you know, <laughs> the 12 scenarios and it is so each one has its own objective that you're trying to complete with everybody. And you are it's essentially a worker placement game. But it also has like that little bit of a push your luck aspect, which I love, I, which I was saying about Candace's game, uh, Wonderland Wars. Um, yeah. I love push your luck. And this one has such an interesting mechanism that I don't think I've seen in another game where it's like, yeah, you could do the work replacement, but you could kind of do it lazily and see if you maybe get hurt while doing it or not even complete what you were trying to do. Or you could just like do the work the way it's supposed to be done and get it done. But if you do that, then you can't do, get everything that you have to do, get done, done. So it's it's sort of like, okay, when can I take my chances? When can I, uh, when, when can I absolutely not take my chances? Like I have to get this done. Uh, and you have to worry about like the weather coming out uh, after you. Uh, there's different beasts and monsters. Well, not monsters, they're actual uh, creatures uh, that are in our real life, I guess, like bears and tigers and stuff. <laughs> Oh my. And uh, so, you know, you're, and you're building up like your weapon and everything. Uh, you're cooking things, uh, inventing things, exploring the island itself. And that is just really cool. And then when you're going up against certain like events and things, uh, they might come back to haunt you because you'll shuffle it back into the event deck. So you just read like the top half of the card and then you shuffle it into the deck. It might come back. And then the bottom half happens. It's like, and now you're poisoned. And it's like, oh, crap. Um, so, <laughs> um, it, so just like dealing with all those things. Uh, I think I've won this game once and I probably played it wrong when I, when I won. Wow. Um, so, <laughs> How many times uh, have you played it? I've played it probably at least like 10 times. Um, wow. Yeah. So, yeah. It, it, and it's uh, maybe more. I'm not sure. But, it, uh, and... I do really love difficult cooperative games. I've played this solo. I've played it with, uh, I think, all player counts at this point. Um, and, and I like it at all player counts, really. Um, and, and they do a really great mechanism for solo, or even if you're playing with two players, where they add uh, Friday, the character Friday, or uh, Friday's dog as well. Uh, and you could play around with them, and they could take on certain tasks for you and stuff like that. So that's pretty cool. Uh, but yeah, that's my pick, Robinson Crusoe. I also just love that kind of story, the survival, the castaway. Uh, it's kind of freaky, but I, I don't know. I really like that survival uh, aspect in games. So I have played this, and I, I really, really dig it. Uh, but I will but. say, <laughs> I will say that I think it is a little bit better as a solo game then like i feel like with the cooperative mode it can suffer from quarterbacking a little bit um and i feel like it's definitely more immersive as a solo game and the only thing that i would say where i wouldn't recommend this game for everyone is yes it is extremely complex you know um like yeah. if i was going to recommend a heavy cooperative game i would say spirit island but this game is good um this game is good it's hard again i think it might be better for solo than cooperatively so mm. but i do like it i'll leave it there Fine. so <laughs> i played this fairly recently it was a uh, during during COVID. so it was, well, it could have been like three years ago at this point and um and i am on a podcast you might know board games insider with ignacy chevy check the designer right we've been running this podcast for many years and i told him on the podcast hey, ignacy i got to play robinson crusoe he said yeah we lost the first game you know and then the second game we did the woodpile uh scenario i think that's the second scenario first scenario. i don't remember and i said and we won and he said you played wrong yeah. that was what he said <laughs> obviously <laughs> we can't win it 
on the yes. second play is what he told me because this yeah, game is not. insanely hard to win now yeah, yeah okay get better at bonacore i understand but the point is it's i say just, get good get good All right, I'm cool enough to do. get good um it's it's too hard i mean that's my knock on this game it's it it's it's a really thematic well thought out um the game just just does work on every level and i i the candace's point about it being a great solo game really makes sense too because right now you're in control of the whole thing right and, and if you've got okay i'm gonna implement this strategy and try to make it work you're on your own and you hopefully you do it but it is insanely hard i mean it's like there's no harder cooperative game on the planet and then you add the complexity in the game and it's it's a lot of frustration i did back the ultimate edition too because i really want it with all those cool pieces <laughs> so i'm gonna have it in my collection i'm gonna have my my portal game stuff is over there i'm gonna have it in my collection um and i do look forward to playing it again at some point with some really good expert players matthew let's play it um but it is if anybody who doesn't want a lot of frustration in their life <laughs> you know stay away from this game if you don't want to <laughs> oh i love frustration so give I, it to me this is, <laughs> this is another game i haven't played i like i said I, i'm not a solo gamer i also am known to not like cooperative games so like it, that's just not my kind of play style so like everything about this game i love the theme don't get me wrong i think a survival theme matthew is like also a really cool theme but like you know like i have also heard that it was better as a solo game or just a cooperative game and so like everything about and then i heard it's really hard and i'm just like i have no desire to play this game <laughs> like I, i'll hard. play every game once and like so if everyone anyone this is an open invitation everyone wants to play with me or teach me how to play i'm willing to learn but i also heard the rule book is kind of like a beast to get through Beast. Yeah, Beast. like it's a little wonky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like a lot of those have kept me away <laughs> from the game. Um, because yeah. come on, it's 2023. I can't do like 12, 30 page rule books anymore. <laughs> I mean, if it's, if it's I, I well written could. and organized, it's not that bad. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah. I watch how to play videos. So you know, there, there are some good that's how to play true. videos on this uh, on, okay, on this game. Um, uh, I also hear there's a, like a really good teach the teach video on this game. I'm just kidding. I actually, I don't remember if I covered this game to be honest. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, no, I, I, I hear that it's not going to be for everybody because it is really, it is difficult to win. Uh, personally for me and my group, we love that. We love that we can't win. <laughs> um, we're like, I don't want yeah. to ever win this game. <laughs> um, and <laughs> <laughs> it's just... I don't know. I I I hear you though, but I also don't um with the quarterbacking, um I actually hadn't heard that uh people tend to enjoy this more as a solo game. I actually haven't had a problem with that because it's so difficult. All of us are kind of like I have no idea what to do, you know. Um and so we're all like maybe we could do that, you know, so it, it does gotcha. bring up discussion for us, uh but I could see it where somebody else, you know, maybe quarterback yeah. could be a problem. Uh, it hasn't been for me, but yep, no, co-op is right up my alley. The theme is up my alley. The push your luck, worker placement, like it's all, it's it's got it all for me. So Steven, what's Steven, your, what are you? What what's your you uh, game? <laughs> I was waiting, waiting for the toss. <laughs> 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 okay. So I have, of course, the best of the four games. And the game that I have selected is Letters from Whitechapel. Published originally in 2011 by Fantasy Flight Games, designers Gabriel Mari and Gianluca Santopietro. How about that? Uh, published by Fantasy Flight, as I mentioned, and many other sub-licenses. Uh, mechanics, team-based, one versus many. Uh, secret unit deployment point-to-point -point movement, memory a little bit, and hidden movement. Two to six players, 90 to 150 minutes, so it can be a long game. Uh, ages 14 plus, and that's, if nothing else, for the theme. And uh, speaking <clears throat> about a bad English accent, you enter the poor and dreary Whitechapel district in London, 1888, the scene of the mysterious Jack the Ripper murders, which is crowded and with smelly alleyways, hawkers, shouting merchants, 
dirty children covered in rags who run through the streets and beg for money and prostitutes called the wretched on every street corner. I'm grabbing that from their uh, their thematic write up on Board Game Geek. Um, and Letters of Whitechapel places you right there into that environment. One player plays Jack the Ripper, and their goal is to murder five victims of the wretched before being caught. The other players are police detectives who must cooperate to catch Jack the Ripper before the end of the game. Uh, the game board uh, represents London's Whitechapel district circa 1888 and is marked with about 200 numbered circles that are linked together. Uh, during play, the policeman and the wretched are moved on dotted lines uh, that represent the Whitechapel streets, while Jack the Ripper is moving stealthily between the numbered circles, sometimes on foot, sometimes in a carriage, and sometimes in the back alleyways. The policemen patrol to find clues to where Jack was, because you have to say where you were if they, if they search for a clue, and hopefully to perform an arrest before Jack returns to his hideout each night. If, after four nights and five murders, Jack is not caught, Jack the Ripper wins. If Jack is ever caught by the police on any one of those nights, the police officers win as a team. So if you've played Scotland Yard, you can call this game like Scotland Yard on steroids. Much more going on, but it has that DNA that, ha that is similar to Scotland Yard between the ways that you can travel on the streets of, of England in Scotland Yard or specifically in, the, in London in the Whitechapel District in this game. If you play Fury of Dracula, this is a very, very stripped down version of, the, of a one versus many hidden movement game. Fury of Dracula's got all kinds of mechanics. Goes can go on for four hours. I love that game too. This is more distilled uh, and just excellently shows this theme through as well as the great mechanics in it. Um, when I play this game, I love playing Jack the Ripper. I role play Jack the Ripper. I'm in character playing Jack the Ripper. And I really creep people out. And I just like it. I'm a, I'm a big role player too. But I, so I really like just being into it. So as they're finding like little clues, I'll be like, ooh, did I, did I leave that bloody handkerchief there that I wiped off my knife? Oh. So they, they find it and they feel more into the, into the game. At least I, I think that I get more into the game and, and the players do as well. That was a pretty it good accent. It, <laughs> oh, I, I, I've, I've, I've practiced a little. Um, it doesn't matter if I win or lose this game. Um, I, and I almost always lose. In fact, I've played the game maybe five times, six times. And I think I've won once the first time I played as Jack. And I haven't won six. Um, uh, haven't won at all since. Um, I love this game. It's an amazing thematic group experience. Um, and it's basically everything I love in the game. I love hidden movement. I love deduction. Uh, trying to, if you're on the other side, calculating where Jack has gone uh, as the police or outsmarting your fellow players as Jack. A fantastic social experience as well. It's a 10 out of 10 for me. And while all of the games being mentioned on the Today Show are excellent games, really, Letters of Whitechapel is the best of all of them. And I will point out that this game was nominated in 2011 for a Golden Geek in Best Thematic Board Game category. Your Honor, the defense rests. I have lot. My game has won a lot, a lot of awards too. Do you want me to? And the, they've no. won awards. It's, not even been nominated. Pass, pass, pass the time. <laughs> you had a chance. You missed your chance. <laughs> yeah, my my so, game uh, won in 2013 Golden Geek Award. So yeah. Oh, yeah, mine burn. is a Spiel des Jar winner, burn. like a Spiel des Jar winner. I'm just saying. <laughs> wow. So that little nomination is nothing. I actually have not played <laughs> <laughs> Letters of Whitechapel. I at some point uh, bought it because a friend of mine said it was really good. And I do like, I, I do enjoy hidden movement games. Uh, I played Fury of Dracula before like a partial game at a convention, like a, a you know, a 101 where they were teaching the game. And I was like, this is cool. And uh, I bought it, it sat in shrink for a while for a while and just something never made me you know break it out and i eventually sold it and you know i will be down to try it but and i agree that you know if you like hidden movement games i think this is like a very good one just from what i've heard and read but 
Eh, maybe not everybody's going to be into that theme of having someone murdering prostitutes around, you know, England. Yeah, I think that's so, valid. I, <laughs> I think that is a valid concern of why I like that's kind of one of the reasons why I haven't played it. Like the theme does nothing <laughs> for me. Like I like the macabre. Don't get me wrong. I went to London. I went on a Jack the Ripper theme, but I don't want to be Jack the Ripper. You know what I mean? Like I never want to be that character. You can solve um, the case. So, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, I I think um, it would. It sounds fun, and it's definitely something I would love to play. I also haven't played it, um, but I it, like it, it's like I like that all verse, like you no know, one versus many kind of like feeling, and I th and especially the person who's by themselves has played it before. I think being thrown into that role with no experience oh, yeah. would suck. But if you've like played it before, I think it could be like, you know, you kind of were saying Steven is kind of like a storytelling element. And I think that's why like it could be fun. Mm -hmm. Could be. Yeah. Maybe. It could be. Could yeah, I'm not, I'm not there yet. Yeah, it could be fun though. Yeah. Maybe it could be. Um, yeah, I love one versus many games. Um, this one, I, I really, I would like to try it. I, it's weird. It, it was one of those games I, I've always seen it like in the, you know, board game stores. Uh, and I'll look at it. I'm like, do I want it? And then I just pass it by like something about, I don't know, the cover of the game, whatever. It looks boring. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, so uh, I, I always kind of pass on it. And then I love Fury of Dracula where I, I kind of get that kick anyway. It's not based yeah. on like a real person who like killed people and things like that. Um, although it's interesting well, with Jack the Ripper uh, with, uh, being like the serial killer. I think uh, the history books pretty much say that this Jack the Ripper character, uh, it, it, they he didn't kill as many people as we think he did. Like it, it was more like a, I mean, even killing one person is bad, but it was more like a two to three person. <laughs> um, instead of like uh, the Ripper, he's killing everybody in sight kind of thing. Yeah. So, um, but regardless, it's, uh, off it's that tangent. unknown. The actual, right, the actual story uh, yeah. is, is, is yeah. very unknown what happened. There are many possible, and by the way, historicals should really not be in this character, in this category. However, Jack the Ripper has become more of a legend and has yeah. now been put into literature. In case yeah. in point on this, Jack the Ripper has been on the USS Enterprise on Star Trek. So Jack the Ripper is much bigger than the the event that occurred. What? Yes. Oh, absolutely. On, and uh, Alice the, from Alice in Wonderland was on the Millennium Falcon. So, <laughs> boom. <laughs> but anyway, so that's why I think this is okay because there's been books written, but but fictional books, again, just added and added and added. That's why this yeah. is bigger than the the uh the, the historical portion of this that's why i believe it could be part of this category just want to add that in. oh no yeah i agree with you on that um but it, yeah in terms of the gameplay i don't i don't know because i haven't played it uh but i i do like other ones um like i said fury of dracula is really good and you can also get that role play in uh for that one i it might it's probably longer than letters white chapel from what i'm gathering oh, yeah. um oh yeah but um I, I seem to just like more uh, complicated games, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> so. <laughs> so, yeah, yes, so you uh, would like yeah. Wonderland's War. If you like Quacks, Wonderland's War is a more complicated, interesting version. Yes, yeah, Candace is selling me, Steven. You're not selling me. I'm not selling you on the fact that this is one of the most amazing one versus many experiences, which you which you love. Great deduction, dripping with theme. Okay, yeah, yeah, you're murdering people, but you know, hey, but you can solve the murders. I'll be the murderer if you'd like. I, not a problem. No, I'll we'll okay, play I'll it with you. We'll all play it with you. <laughs> yeah, you will. Okay. Will all right. Be I believe good. that brings us to the close of the show. So today we tackled the very difficult topic of games based on a public domain property or like classic literature stories and legends. And frankly, there are a lot of really good games that fit into this category. I hope you all agree that the choices made by the co-hosts here were excellent and really represent a wide variety of games in the category. What do you think? Tell us in the comments for the show. Agree, disagree, say that Bonacore is a big <laughs> jerk. All of those things are possible. Let <laughs> us know. And just in case you've forgotten, I'm the pod father of gaming, Stephen Bonacore. And I'm Candace Harris from Board Game Geek. 
I'm Matthew Bacac from Room 51. I'm Benita Core from Benita Core. That's the name of my channel. <laughs> <laughs> and we hope to see you next time here on The Quad. Fantastic. I think that went great. Did we, did we do the Brady Bunch look down, look over <laughs> at each other thing? Not enough <laughs> <of us. laughs>